We have all seen stories of the capture and translocation of different animals, especially the Big Five. But who has ever heard of translocating small indigenous rodents? Pygmy, hairy-footed gerbils of all things. There has to be a first for everything. And such translocations are exactly what are happening in Algoa Bay at the port of Nuha on the outskirts of Port Elizabeth. It was here that Arnold Slubbert of the Urban Raptor Project accidentally happened upon a small colony of these gerbils. Here you can see quite a bit of gerbil activity. This time of year always is a very successful time of year to trap them. A lot of young animals and they're quite easy to trap. Transnet is going to develop this whole area here and because this is such a successful colony we're trying to translocate as many individuals as possible to other areas that are remarkably similar and where there's no other species of rodent to compete with them. And once the development takes place, of course, the whole colony will be wiped out here. Using seeds as bait, Arnold sets traps out in the late evenings. There's another nice area with a lot of intensive activity all along here. So it looks pretty positive. We should be reasonably successful. He places motion-triggered cameras in areas of high activity in order to observe them at night. It's a moonless night perfect conditions for pygmy, hairy-footed gerbils to be out and about. These small creatures have a very busy nightlife when they emerge from their burrows to explore new territories, excavate new burrows, forage for food or look for mates. They make a great meal for numerous predators, so they are always alert with large eyes and ears scanning for danger lurking in the dark. Transnet, the port of Mucha Authority, has a conservation policy in place that protects the environment within the port's boundaries and since operations began eight years ago, they have implemented a unique poison-free pest control program developed by Arnold. He sets up raptor nest boxes, then releases eagle owls, barn owls and other raptors to hunt down rodents and to keep pesky pigeons out of the port. No poison has ever been used and this method works a treat. He and partner Alison Kaywood also have a monitoring program. As part of our rodent monitoring program, we set up monitors on the breakwater here to identify possible threats from exotic rodent species, as well as to try and get an idea if rodents were present on the break, in the breakwater area. And we caught our first hairy-footed gerbil here. What is really interesting about it is that although we've done extensive trapping throughout the port, we had not picked up hairy-footed gerbils yet. Although gerbils are common in the arid and desert regions of South Africa, the coast-dwelling gerbil is a distinct and very rare subspecies worth preserving, says Professor Graham Curley of the Center for African Conservation Ecology at the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University. Professor Curley has a special interest in the coastal gerbil and has been searching for new colonies for 20 years. The neat part about this gerbil is it is unique, it's a subspecies, it's endemic, it's only found on the northern shores of Algoa Bay. I've searched the shores of St. Francis Bay, we've trapped all along those dune fields, no success. We've looked around uh, the east of uh, Woody Cape, I've been unable to find them there. So the only place we found them is to the east and the west of the Sundays River mouth. What we think is that in um, previous periods when conditions were drier, the gerbils came down the Sundays River Valley and they colonized the Alexandria coastal dune field and then adapted locally. And there you have this little animal which is blonde compared to its Karoo and Kalahari relatives. It's a pretty little rodent that is making a real success of living in this dune field. These gerbils live in a dangerous place, right on the edge of an intertidal zone where there is always a threat of spring high tides. But it is here that they are well out of the way of the predominant competitors, striped field mice and felt rats that live higher up in the dune fields. So you've got to look at a, a scenario that where the gerbil habitat ends, the rest take over. And the gerbil habitat is extremely limited. It's from the high water mark, this little piece to the fall dunes. That's where they occur. When Arno started looking for suitable habitat to which to translocate the gerbils, he searched northward towards the Sunday's river mouth. This is one of the areas that are identified as suitable for them. They definitely need a couple of things. One, 
being a decent rock structure around them. They use the rock as a shelter so they're not that easily dug out by predators. Because you need to remember that this coastline has a lot of indigenous predators on it, plus your feral cats and dogs. So they've got to survive those. And then secondly, a bit of dune vegetation, which they seem to collect flower and seed from. But they have a good reason to live so close to the high water mark. One of the fun parts of this little gerbil is although they are desert adapted and they come from inland South Africa, here they are able to hunt and effectively predate little marine amphipods and isopods. These are tiny little crustaceans that hang around on the high tide zone and the gerbils will then go and forage at low tide to be able to hunt these little marine organisms. When Arnold heard about the harbour development, he proposed to the Transnet Environmental Group that the entire colony be translocated. They enthusiastically agreed and were eager to witness the operation in action, so they joined Arnold and Allison for the release of the first gerbils. And hopefully you'll be able to get under a rock and find shelter. Remember this is a once-off, eh? Come back. No, you're not going to be able to get it better. There's not going to be an action. Oh, wow. Oh, uh, one of our goals is to ensure that uh, we protect and preserve our biodiversity, which is why we're implementing programs like these ones. Um, ensuring that we implement best environmental practices when we are developing the port. Over the following months, Arnold trapped and captured most of the colony on the eastern breakwater, systematically releasing them at the new site on which he kept a jealous eye. At the back of his mind, the question nagged on why the rodents had not colonized this area before. Fortunately, it seems the gerbils have settled in well, as there are gerbil tracks everywhere, running between the rocks and the dunes on the high water mark where their favorite foods are plentiful. Coastal gerbils are hoarders, filling their mouths with sea pumpkins and other flowers, and then darting back to the shelter of the rocks, or the cafeteria, as the scientists say, to eat or store their harvest. This is now very classic of hairy-footed gerbils. In fact, if you look here carefully, you'll see all the flower heads that have been collected, like I've said, and you see how they eat them out. Nice fresh ones from last night, all brought and eaten here. At least I feel like a success story. This is indeed a success story and Professor Curley feels that the coastal gerbils need our ongoing protection. It's a wonderful story of um, colonization and adaptation, and it also then makes it a particular, particularly special responsibility for South Africa. This is one of our endemic animal forms. We need to look after it. Fortunately, the port of Mucha is a poison-free zone because rodent poison would have certainly wiped out this gerbil colony before it had even been discovered. For the first time, an indigenous rodent colony has been successfully translocated and is being closely monitored. The best news is that they are now increasing in numbers. We now have a fuller picture of the lives of these secretive, rare and comical creatures that are as much a part of our natural heritage as the larger species. <laughs>